All right. Well, tell you what, let's get into the word today. <laughs> Paula's done gone to meddling from her chair down there. <laughs> All right. Listen, uh, turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, if you remember, about three weeks ago, we were in another, another part of this series, uh, Essentials of Spiritual Growth, and we were also in the book of James, so we're going to go back there. James chapter 1. Listen, all summer long, we've been in this series of essentials for spiritual growth. And I'm telling you, these things are, they're not the only things, but they're, they're about 10 things that we've identified that are just absolutely critical. If you desire, and I'm sure you do, you're here today, you're listening online, uh, that you want to continue to grow. And, to, and, our, and our goal is, is, isn't to become uh, like Pastor Rich. Your goal is to become like Jesus Christ. Your goal is much higher than me. My goal is him. You know, and Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And I would say that to you as well. Follow me as I follow Christ. But when I get off base, you don't go off base with me. Amen. So again, so we've been talking about these things that, that are absolutely uh, critical to our, to our life. And, and let me just tell you this. If, if ever you get to that place, and, and you will, and this is not a negative confession, but it's just a fact of life. Sometimes we're just going to get stagnant in our walk with God. You know, sometimes we'll get frustrated. We don't feel like that God is, is responding, that God is answering our prayers, like that we feel like that he should be answering those. And so sometimes we just, we just have a, we get our, get our, you know, you can get your back, you can get your back out of joint, you can get your spirit out of joint too. And sometimes we just need to, we need a, 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 an adjustment in our, in our attitude. And uh, so it's important again. So, so what I'm saying is, if you find yourself at that place, I, there's a, probably a pretty good chance that one of these areas that we've talked about, we talked about, the, in fact, week one was about attitude. The Bible says to have the same attitude of Christ. I like where the Passion Trust says this, let this mindset be your motivation. Let Jesus Christ's mindset be our motivation. Let it be our, not only our example, but God, that's the word I want to go. I want to have the same mindset that he did. So sometimes that, that needs to happen on an adjustment. We talked about the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. And sometimes we're, we're, we're in that stagnant moment because we're not listening to him. He lives on the inside of us. His voice comes from down in here, not from out here. Not from sitting here on your shoulder. A lot of times that's where the enemy sits. He sits and he whispers these things. But the Spirit of God speaks into your spirit man from down on the inside of you, from the very center of you. And the Word of God. Uh, oftentimes we'll go through stagnant times when we... When, we're, when we stay out of the Word of God. And I have to be careful with that because sometimes I'll get like that too. I'll, be, I'll read the Word, but what I'm reading the Word for is for you. I'm reading to study and to prepare for, to, for a message on Sunday, but sometimes I'll neglect my reading. And I need to have my reading for me to help me grow. I don't just grow. You know, thank God that I can read and study and grow along with you guys in this, but I need to have time for myself. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. How can a young man keep his way pure? Psalms 119 verse 9 says, by living his life according to the word. We must spend time in the word. We need to be involved in a, in a life-giving church. When we come to church, we not only receive from the church, but we're also God's purpose is that we would give back. There's not one person that's sitting in this room today or you're listening to us online that you haven't been given a gift, an ability, a heart, a passion from God for the body of Christ. And the local church is not the only place that you can serve, the only place that you can give. Uh, we've got people uh, that, that, give, uh, that, that serve in our Dream Center. It's an extension of our church. We've got, there's people that, that go and have a, have a nursing home ministry. That's giving and sowing. But I'm telling you what, the, one of the greatest playgrounds of using your gifts is in the local church. Because we've got to use the gifts. We've got to walk in love and grace and all of those things. Prayer is an important. Church is important. Uh, grace. I talked about grace, inward grace. And Paula talked about outward grace. Uh, if, for by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. All of these things. So if we ever find ourselves stagnant, just check up on some of these things. Let these things be indicators to you. And what I want to talk about today is, is really, uh, I want to talk about one and I want to mention one. I've got two I want to cover. This is the last in this series that, that we're going to be talking about this. It was a summer series. Labor Day kind of signifies summer being over. So I'm going to end this series today. But again, there's other essentials, and, and, and again, use these things as indicators of if, if, uh, if you find yourself flat and just not growing, uh, look over some of these areas. And again, these two today that I want to talk about uh, are certainly uh, indicators as well. Uh, so you're there in James, James chapter 1. Let me pray. Father, thank you today for your word. 
We thank you, God, for opening the eyes of our understanding. Father, I pray for those that are in this house today, those that are watching us online. God, we, we break every bondage, every addiction, every stronghold. God, we declare that it's broken off of our lives. It is destroyed. Your word tells us that your anointing destroys the yoke of bondage. So those things are broken off of our life. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. So, Father, we don't have to walk around in bondages, with addictions, with strongholds over our life. With iniquities, Father, we thank you. They're broken off of us because of Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. We bless you and we honor you. Give us eyes and ears and hearts to receive what the, you've got for us this particular Sunday. Lord, there's not one person today that came in these doors or tuned in today online that uh, caught you by surprise. You knew they would be here. You knew this word would be shared. So, Holy Spirit, reveal things to us. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, if you agreed with that, would you say amen? Amen. amen. So, let me, let me tell you... Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, temptation uh, first today, and I want to tell you about a story. Uh, I'll tell you about a story about a guy named Mark. Uh, that's just a name that I just chose. It's not talking about if your name is Mark, I'm not talking about you, okay? So this particular Mark, uh, he was, he was he pretty uh, overweight, and uh, he's, he he. Uh, the place that he worked was a kind of a place with young people that were all involved in health, and they had groups and stuff like that. And so he always kind of felt out of place. So he, he made a radical decision that he was going to shed some, some excess weight. And uh, what he did was, one of the things that he did to do that is he made, a, he made this decision to change his route on the way to work. Because on his way to work, there was this donut and pastry shop that he stopped at every day. And got him a big bag of pastries and a cup of coffee or whatever. And, uh, and he, he would go on. So he made this decision. He told the people at work that that's what he was doing. Man, they were all excited for him. They were cheering him on. And, man, come on, you can, you can do this and stuff. And, and uh, a couple of weeks go by, and he's on his way to work. Uh, he comes into work, and uh, he has this big bag of pastries in his, in his hand. And the people that said, Mark, what's, what's going on? What, what, what are you doing? What, I thought you, you gave those things up. He said, man, these aren't ordinary donuts. These are God donuts. These are a blessing from the Lord. Let me tell you what happened. He said, I was on my way to work today, and I forgot, and I came down, down my old route, and there, oh, there's that donut shop again. And I just thought, I said, Lord. He said, I just said, Lord. He said, maybe this is you. Maybe, this is good. maybe you're giving me a treat today, and maybe you wanted me to come, come this way. And uh, he said, Lord, you'll just have to show me if this is you. He said, Lord, he said, just give me a parking place right there in front of the shop. And if you do, God, I'll know that it's you. And, and they, because usually there, there's no, you know, it's hard to get a parking place right there. So if, if it's open, then I know, I know that this is from you, God. And sure enough, after eight times around the block, there was a car that was pulling out and I got a place right there. So these are blessings. These are rewards uh, for, for the donuts. How many of you have ever treated temptation that way? <laughs> oh, this has got to be from God. You know, the, you know, you need a little bit of money, and the cashier gave you back an extra 20 that you shouldn't have given back. They, oh, praise the Lord. You know I needed this, Lord. There's that temptation to keep that thing. How many of you ever justify that this must be God doing that? And uh, so putting this temptation theme in, in this essentials of spiritual growth. This isn't something that necessarily, it's essential. I'll go out and find temptation. It's just going to be there. Since we live in this world, Satan's the God of this world. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four. He's the God of this world. We're going to be tempted in things. Jesus said in this world, we will face tribulation. We will face temptation. We will face tests and trials. It's just a part of, again, it's a part of our life. But I want you to notice what the nature of temptation as spoken of by James here in James chapter one, verse 13, James chapter one, verse 13. And uh, I'm gonna pull this over just a little bit closer. It might be exactly where they wanted it, but ah, I got it there. So you guys will see it up there too, and you can see on the screen there if you guys can't see it over there. And welcome to the, uh, welcome to the, uh, the uh, uh, right side of the auditorium. <laughs> good to see you. you guys are normally over here, but how does it feel over there? Is it good? Different. It's different. It's different. Uh, okay. Welcome, other. Good to see you. All right. So, uh, so listen, here we are in James chapter one, verse 13, English standard version. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. I like what the, the passion translation says. God is incapable of being tempted by evil and he is never the source of temptation. 
Listen, this is, a, this is an important message here because, because in, our, in our previous message three weeks ago when we talked about the essential of, of trials, uh, James, James mentioned here that the thing about trials is they are essential to our spiritual growth. Temptation is not essential. It's just something that we're going to face, but, but trials are. Because remember what James said he, in, in verse 2? He says, count it all joy, brothers. He says, when you fall into various trials. Remember the message says, consider the sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides because you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into open and show its true colors. So don't try to, don't try to get out of anything prematurely. This is what it says there in the Message Bible. Let it have its work. And what is this work to help you become mature, well-developed, not deficient in any way? One translation says not lacking in anything. That's the purpose of trials in our life. But again, here, that's, this, is, this is a little bit different. Here, this is interesting because the same basic root Greek word f- for trials in James chapter 2 is the same basic root Greek word for temptation here in verse 13 that we just read. It's interesting. It's a, but here's the difference. Here's the difference. Um, trials, trials are used by God to strengthen us. Not only are they used by God, but sometimes they are, and oftentimes they are opposed by God. Tests and challenges are posed by God to help us to grow. They strengthen us. They help us to advance our spiritual growth. While temptation, on the other hand, is used by the devil in his cohorts. Do you know that the enemy has assignments after your life, just like we have good angel assignments after us that watch over us. You have an angel. Ronnie, I know your angel is, works full time. He's been, you, when you get to heaven, you need to give him a thank you note or take him something. I don't know. But listen, temptation is an invitation for us to disobey and to rebel against God with the goal in mind. Here's the goal of temptation is to stagnate your walk with God. To stagnate you, to, to bring your, your walk and your spiritual progress again to a halt. Because you're going to remember, remember trials, trials again, they're used by God to help strengthen us, to, to perfect us. And here's what we need to understand is that Satan can take a test. He can take a trial. And again, remember, what's the purpose of a trial? To, to help us, that we would grow, that we would mature through that. But he can take a test and a trial and turn it into a temptation to defeat you. So a test posed by God can also be a temptation that Satan uses to to trip us up. Let me give you an example here. In Genesis chapter 2, God put a tree in the midst of, of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he said in verse 13, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Who was he talking to? Adam and Eve. And again, that was put there by God, not as a temptation, but really as a test of their willingness to obey him. Hello? God used, well, why did God do that? Why did God put that there? He, God knows the price, price of the faith. He knew they were going to fall because God gave Adam and Eve a free will. And if everything that he did, he didn't do anything so that they wouldn't make the mistake, they had to have a free will. And he put that there to test, again, their free will. Satan comes along and turns this test into a temptation, an opportunity to rebel, an opportunity to sin, an opportunity to do evil. But let's bring this, let's bring this just a little closer to home. Maybe you're going through a financial hardship right now. And perhaps it's a, perhaps it's a test set up by God. Let me say that again. Maybe you're going through a financial hardship right now, and maybe, perhaps, it's a test set up by God to see what you're going to do. Who are you going to turn to to get your needs met? Because God makes all kind of promises in his word that he will be, will be El Shaddai, the God who's more than enough in our life. He is El Shaddai. He is, El, uh, he is uh, Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees the need in our life before they ever even arise. How, who are we going to turn to? How are we going to respond? Because, because there, there could be something, that, that, that an, an opportunity the, to, to do something about that lack in our life. But the only thing about it is it's a little bit shady. Uh, in other words that we could use, it's a little bit unethical. And are we going to turn to that? Or are we going to trust? Are we going to trust God? So there's times, again, when a test can, can turn into a temptation, but it never is turned into a temptation by God. Because God, as we just saw, does not tempt us. He doesn't tempt us. There's never an occasion. 
in, in a sexual sense. There's never an occasion where God puts sexual sin to tempt us. Never. God never tempts us with sin. However, however, God will allow a test. He will allow us to be tested in an area uh, by Satan. He will allow us to be tempted in an area by Satan. Is that right? Will God allow us to be tempted? Well, he certainly will. Adam and Eve, again, we've already just, we've just read about them in Genesis chapter 2. God allowed them to be tested, tempted by the enemy. God will not tempt you, but he will allow Satan at times to, to tempt us. Jesus, if you remember in Matthew chapter 1, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says that Jesus, after he came out of the, the, the Jordan from being baptized by John the Baptist, he came out and was led in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Who was he led there by? Was it Satan? Come here, come here, come into the desert, come into the desert. I've got something to show you. No, he was led into the desert. This is scripture. You can read it for yourself, Matthew 4, 4. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Not, not tempted by God. So God will allow us to be. He'll allow us to be tempted. So if God doesn't tempt us, so where does temptation come from? Well, we, we know the answer to that. We've just been talking about Satan. But watch this. Watch this. Listen to what James says. Remember verse 13. Let me read verse 13 to you, to you again. Put that up there, Paula. Click. See, again, verse 13 says, Let no one say that when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But look, look at verse 14 now. Verse 14 says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Listen to what that, the, the New International Version says this. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. By his own evil desire. Own evil desire, what it equals is an unrenewed desire. An unyielded evil desire, an unyielded thing of our flesh. It's unyielded to, to God. Do you know when, when you got born again, you know, realize that, you know, God is a, he's a tri-being. Is that right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. We are created in God's image. We are a tri-being as well. I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I have a, and I have a body. I have flesh. My, my soul is made up of my mind, my will, and my emotions. And those unyielded, unyielded desires sometimes, unyielded things in my mind, in my flesh, those things can come back and, and haunt us. Remember, just, that's why it says in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. Again, the Passion Translation says, but inwardly, but be, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. See, we're supposed to take something. When you got born again, what part of you got born again? Your flesh? No. Your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions? No. Your spirit man got born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, if any man's born again, he's a brand new creation, a whole new species of being. It's talking about your spirit man. But your flesh, your flesh did not get saved. Your, your, your mind did not get saved. That's why it's, we're told here in Romans that we're to do something with it, to transform our mind by the renewing of our mind by the word of God. We've got to take those old desires and, and crucify that flesh. That's why Paul said in Galatians, Galatians 2.20, he, he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, I crucify my flesh. That's something that we have to do all the time. When we recognize these desires that are not godly desires, we have to crucify them. And sometimes it's a daily crucifixion. Sometimes it's a five times a day crucifixion. It depends on how many times that flesh comes up. Listen, when I was a kid, when I was probably 9, 10, 11 years old, man, I, was, I would steal. And I'd go in stores and I would steal what, what big things. Wasn't stealing diamonds or anything like that. You know what I was stealing as a kid? I was stealing football cards. And one reason was my cousin played professional football. He played for the Atlanta Falcons. And I was trying to find his card. So I've justified it. That's the only reason I was stealing them. <laughs> but I would steal those things and, 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 and all those things. 
But, you know, as, as, I, as I grew, and I think I may have gotten, went, went into a store with some kids one time, and they stole. I didn't. I, I told them where to get the bag and stuff like that. So when we got caught, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. But I was a part of them. You know, I was driving the car. You know, I was only 12, but I was driving the car, so to speak. But today, that is not something that when I get up in the morning, I have to crucify my, my flesh not to steal. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's something that, that I, I got a hold of in my life. And, and, but there's other things in, in our lives that, you know, you can be tempted in sexually. You can be tempted in, in money. You can be tempted in, in, in buying things. Hello? Did you know you can be tempted in buying things? You know, sometimes we buy things that we shouldn't be buying because we're having to borrow God's money to buy it. When I'm saying God's money, I'm talking about our tithe. We couldn't afford that house if we didn't take God's money. The things that the 10 percent that belong to him so sometimes there's things that we just don't need to but we're tempted to that so we have to crucify our flesh paul is working on that she's crucifying that flesh on that shopping thing i'm, I'm with you honey so listen to this but listen listen to what james is telling us here listen to what he's telling us here in, in verse 14 because there's areas of our mind, there's areas in our thoughts that haven't been renewed. They haven't been transformed. They haven't been yielded yet. And they become a temptation. And let me tell you, I mean, oh, does the devil know you? He knows you better than you know yourself. You know, the Bible says that the iniquities can be passed down to the third and the fourth generation. First generation would be my father, then my grandfather, then my great-grandfather, and then my great-great-grandfather. Sins that they walked in, iniquities that they had in their life can be passed down to the third and the fourth, down to me. There's things that Satan knows about my family history that I don't know. There's things that, that he knows us, so he knows our weaknesses. He knows, you know, it's like a coach that studies the, 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 uh, the other team's game films. And he le they learn things. They see things about them. They see things about a, a, a defense, or an offensive tackle in blocking. And they notice that when it went, during the play that he always starts off this way, even if he's going that way or if he's going this way, because he, he's, he's got a weak knee. He's got a brace on that knee. They notice that and they, 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 they capitalize on that. They know that a quarterback has, has uh, had, had a broken ankle that he's, he's recovering from. And now he's, you know, he's set out of here. Now he's back. They know that ankle's still weak. What do they tell their defense to do? Go in, go after that ankle. Go after his knees. Take this out from under him. They're going after weaknesses. That's what the enemy knows. He knows your weaknesses, again, better than you do. I want you to notice the progression. Notice the progression in this, in this statement here. We're going to say it in the area of temptation. But watch this. So a look, so a look, reap a thought. So a look, reap a thought. So a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. And we could add one more to this. It's not up here, but we could show this. So a character, reap a destiny. So a destiny, reap an eternity. But I want you to notice something. Notice it all started with a look. It all started with a look. How many of you know this, that there's a difference between seeing and looking? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. There's a difference between seeing and looking. You know, I could, I could sit here this morning and just, just go with me for a minute. I could just sit here and I could just be just sitting right here and just kind of be thinking about some things. What am I going to do? wonder where we're going to go eat lunch today. wonder what we'll do today. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing things that are going on. I'm seeing a little movement here, not much. And seeing a little, saw, saw him reach in his pocket. Oh, he's getting out of his wallet. He's going to pay for lunch now. But I'm seeing different things. Right now, I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking at those guys on the camera. I'm looking at them, but I see my hands over here. I'm not, even, I'm not looking at them, am I? But I see them peripherally. I'm seeing it, but now, now, what I'm, now I'm looking at it. There's a difference, again, between, there's a difference between seeing and looking. A look implies focused attention. Focused attention. So a look, reap a thought. Let's say King David goes out, he's over his kingdom like he does every day. Let's assume that he got up, that he put on a royalty uh, bathrobe. He's got his, I don't know what they drank back then for coffee or whatever. Let's say that they had some kind of crazy beans or something. And uh, he, you know, he takes his coffee and he goes out and he's just, 
It's beautiful. The birds are singing and he's looking over. His, he's looking just kind of out over the kingdom, not looking about, you know, where's this and where's that? What's going on? It's just, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful day. Not really looking at anything, but just seeing. He's just, you know, he's just, he's just seeing different things. Birds fly by and stuff like this. But something catches his attention. So there's some movement down here and it's, oh, that's Uriah's wife. That's Bathsheba down there. He knew, he knew his neighbors. They lived there. They lived. He was in the palace. They, his, he was one of his captains of, of his guard, so he lived probably very close proximity. And something caused attention, something he, was, he wasn't seeing, and all of a sudden, he's, now he's looking. Oh, man. Man, she's beautiful. He is, she is beautiful. And I could go on and on. She's this. She's that. Man, she's this. So a look, reap a thought. So a thought reap an action. David sowed a look, he reaped a thought, and he reaped an action. Fortunately for David, it wasn't something that became a habit. There was a prophet by the name of Nathan that came to David and told David a story about a man who, who had a he had just one little lamb that they treated it as a daughter. He ate at his table and his kids, it was like, a, it was like a, his kids, like, it was almost like family to him. And his next door neighbor had a big ranch, had many sheep. He had a traveler come to him and, and, um, and he wanted to prepare uh, some lamb for him. And he had hundreds of lambs he could have chose from, but he snuck over and had his servants bring over this one man's little pet lamb and they sacrificed that one. And David was furious when he, he told him this. And then he pointed to David and he said, David, he said, you were that man. You, were, you did that. You took Uriah's one little lamb and David, again, he was furious. And what the Bible tells us, that David repented. I think Psalms, was it Psalms 51, take not your Holy Spirit from me. David repented of that. And so therefore, praise God, it wasn't a habit. David is known after a man after God's own heart, someone that loved God. He, did he sin? Yeah, he messed up. We all mess up. But it all started, it all started with a, an unfettered look at something. But here's the... Here's the good news. Again, the bad news, again, we're all going to be tempted in life. But here's the good news. God has not left us defenseless against a strong enemy. Here's a wonderful verse that I would encourage you to, to memorize. And, and, and this is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Commit this to memory. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The New Living Translation says, The temptations in your life are no different than what others experience. Well, that's good to know. Isn't that comforting? And God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful and he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you're tempted, he'll show you a way out so that you can endure. So here's the thought. Here's my thought. Here's my thought with that, that God will not allow me to be overcome by temptation that is absolutely beyond my capacity to endure. God will not allow me to be uh, taken by temptation that is absolutely beyond my capacity to endure. Listen, if you're facing temptation, if you're going through a temptation, listen to this, you can be as assured of this that that temptation has already passed through heaven's review board and you can handle it. According to that scripture, there's nothing. God won't allow you to go through anything that you can't handle. It's already passed through heaven's review board. Every temptation, with every temptation, there's an exit sign over it. There's a way out. God leaves us a way out of every temptation. Listen, three things that we fight against. The devil, the flesh, and the world. And these things are constantly like telemarketers calling us and soliciting us. And we call and we put them on the do not call list, but they keep calling back and they keep soliciting us. The world, the flesh, and the devil constantly are coming at you, soliciting you to rebel and to, again, to sin against God. Have you ever heard of the term or thought about this term, dress for success? Dress for success. Well, we can spiritually, we can be dressed for success. Listen, the devil, as strong as he is, as hard as the, the world's pull on us and our flesh pulls on us, it's nothing compared to the power of God. Listen to what, this, listen to what it says here. The devil is no match for us. First John, First John chapter 4, verse 4 says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. James 4, 7 says this. English Standard Version, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. 
When you talk about being dressed for success, spiritually speaking, we have to look no further than Ephesians chapter 6 to find our heavenly wardrobe. Now listen to what it says here. It says, therefore, this is Ephesians 6 verse 13, English Standard Version. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, as shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace. Verse 16, in all circumstances, take the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts from the evil one. And that's what temptation is a lot of times, man. It's just flaming darts. And verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In reality, what this verse is telling us to do is put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at all of these things. Look at this. The belt of truth. Listen, to the belt of truth. Again, Jesus is the truth. The breastplate of righteousness, Jesus is our righteousness. The gospel of peace, he is our peace. The Bible says that he is Jehovah Shalom. He is the shield of faith. He is the perfecter of our faith. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith, the heaven of salvation. He is our savior, our savior that gives us salvation. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the, and the word became flesh. Jesus is all of these things. So in essence, what we're agreeing with is what Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on this. Listen, this isn't something that we get dressed on Sunday morning spiritually. Of course, we put on our natural clothes, but we came this morning. We put on our spiritual armor today. And when we get home, we take off our Sunday clothes and we take off our armor. We put it in the closet. We go out. No, this is daily. This is what we get up with daily, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every day we put on this armor. We don't leave the house without this armor on. And if you're falling to, to temptation, I'll guarantee you, you're, you're naked. Spiritually speaking, you don't have on the armor. You don't have on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, if our flesh didn't want to do it, then there wouldn't be no temptation to it. If your flesh didn't want it, if it wasn't something that was attractive to your flesh, then you, then you wouldn't want to do it. It wouldn't be a desire that you have. We have to, again, crucify those things. Listen, the purpose, the purpose is that we keep our eyes on the perfecter of our faith. We keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can be victorious over anything and everything. Anything and everything. Anything that the devil can bring cannot, cannot, cannot defeat you. The only way it can defeat us is if we give in to it. He can coerce us. He can deceive us. He can lie to us. But he can't make us sin. He can't make us fall to temptation. He's got to have our agreement. So real quickly, I want to mention one other area uh, that's, uh, again, this is another one of those indicators. Like I said, how we handle trials is an indicator. How we handle uh, the Word of God is an indicator. How we handle temptation, it's an indicator. And this is another indicator. It's our giving, our generosity. Our attitude towards giving is really an indicator of our spiritual growth. The Bible, God's Holy Word, talks more about money and possessions and stewardship than it does about heaven, hell, prayer, and faith all put together. It talks more about money and possessions than about all four of those other things put together. That's amazing. 16 of the 38 parables, Jesus talked about money and possessions. He talked about those things. There is an acute disease that attacks many Christians, and it's called cirrhosis of the giver. <laughs> Listen, our giving... Our giving, somebody was home, you're sleeping, he said somebody, cirrhosis of the liver, no, cirrhosis of the giver. <laughs> our giving is a response to God's grace. Our giving is a response to God's grace. You know, Paul, Paul asked this question in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, says this, what do you have that you have not received? What do you have that you have not received? Nothing. Everything that we have, including the breath in our lungs, everything that we have. Our eyesight, everything, our touch, our feel, our smell, all of our five senses, everything. God gives us the ability. Well, I'll work for that. Well, if God didn't give you the strength in your body, you wouldn't be able to do it. Everything is a gift from God. James 1.17 says, every good, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Listen, when it comes to money and possessions, there's something that we really need to get a grip on, that we really need to get an understanding on, and that's, when it comes to money and possessions, is the deal between ownership and stewardship. Who's the owner and who's the steward? God owns it all, and we're just simply the stewards of it. Everything that we have, my family, 
uh, my, this church, everything, everything belongs to him. Is that right? Yeah. I said this a moment ago, our grace is a response. Our giving is a response to God's grace in our life. It's amazing how history repeats itself. Not just, to, not just in, the, in the world, but also in the church. You go back into the book of Malachi and God was correcting the children of Israel, his family. He was correcting them over, over robbing him of the tithes and the offerings. In Malachi chapter, chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, we see this. And they were, they, were, they, were, they were robbing God. This is what God says. And they said, how are we robbing you? He says, you're robbing me in the tithes and the offerings. Today, less than 6%, less than 6% of Christians tithe. Less than 6% of Christians are doing the exact same things they did over 2,000 years ago. More than that, probably about 2,500 years ago. More than that, doing the same things today. What were the people in Malachi's day doing with the, with the tithe? Again, I, like I said earlier, the same thing that many of us are doing. We're, we're buying things that we probably shouldn't be buying. We're buying houses that are probably more than we have to have. We have to have the tithe to be able to afford that, to qualify for that and things like that. They probably did the same things that we do today. I'm sharing this with you because there's an undeniable part of our spiritual maturity that comes that's attached to, to our giving. I'm not trying to twist your arm today. I'm not trying, you know, God doesn't like sob stories and not trying to tell you the church, church, we're just, we're going down if we don't, there's, there's nothing like that. This church is blessed with good givers. I've told you that over the last several weeks. I'm, I'm amazed that through, this, through these last five months, uh, the giving in our church has been substantial. It's been amazing. And that's, that's, that's more than 6% of people. So I'm saying 6% of Christians worldwide tithe. But see, God is more interested in our attitude about giving and generosity than he is about a percentage. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Let giving flow from your hearts, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from a joy of giving, all because God loves a hilarious giver. And I want to close with this. I want to close with this because I want, to, I want to make this connection. And hopefully this will take you, if you haven't already made this connection, this will take you to a whole new level of understanding about this. Let's say that, let's say that you become a, a hilarious, generous giver. And you love and you, you look for opportunities to give. And God's, God is pleased. God is pleased with that. We just read that in, in that passage. And I want you to know this next verse applies to you. Let me go back and read verse 7 for you one more time. It says, let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving, all because God loves a hilarious, loves hilarious generosity. Now listen what the very next verse goes. This is, this is what applies to you when, you get, when we get our heart in that place where we become hilarious givers. Verse 8 says this, yes, this is the Passion Translation still. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace. With every form of grace. So that you will have more than enough of everything. Every moment and in every way, He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing that you do. That's God's promise when we get to that place where we are generous, faithful givers. God's grace God's grace and how we respond to that oftentimes is how we give back to him that we recognize again that we're stewards in those things God loves a cheerful giver whose heart's in his giving he opens up the floodgate of his grace and he lets us flow unhindered Father today we thank you for your word thank you for your word thank you Father for for the privilege of God of walking with you living with you thank you Father thank you Lord Jesus thank you Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's all stand. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father. God, there has been nothing that we talked about today. There has been nothing, God, that is, that is not but common to man. But God, you will not allow us to be tempted beyond, God, what we can endure. God, I thank you for the reminder of you, the Holy Spirit, to teach us, to remind us, God, that we're clothed, that we put on the Lord Jesus Christ every day of our life. We crucify our flesh, those evil desires and things that come up in our life, God, that we know that are not of you, that are not, they're not your will in our life. We crucify those things. We bless you today. We thank you, Father. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to, to bring the soul into your kingdom. Thank you, Father. Thank you for our jobs. Thank you for increasing our jobs. Thank you for raises, bonuses. Oh, God, we bless you today. We thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We 
love you today, Lord Jesus. We love you today. We honor you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God.